Welcome to chapter 11, where we're going to be talking about the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Now, I've mentioned this, I've talked about it in passing a lot uh, in the course. I'd be like, well, you know, depending on what the transmission mechanism is and all that, <clears throat> and it might have left a lot of you like kind of scratching your heads going like, okay, well, what, what in the hell is he talking about? Uh, we're going to learn about what I was talking about today. And the thing is, we've learned in some of the last couple lectures that monetary policy can impact real economic variables. There can be a change to monetary policy, and that can have some kind of a short-run impact or a short-to-medium-run impact on real variables like real GDP or unemployment. We haven't really learned how yet, right? We've, we've learned, okay, we've learned what the process is. Like, there's an increase in some broad monetary aggregate, and then that leads to a reduction in interest rates, and then, like, we've learned that, but we haven't really learned the true, like, nitty-gritty, like, we haven't gotten into the guts of it. And we're going to be doing that today, um, minus, you know, actually cutting into anybody or carving up any dead animals and looking at their guts. We're not going to be doing that today. Um, instead, we're going to be learning about how Fed policy can ultimately affect real economic variables as well as the price level. Now, if we're going to be monetary economists, we're going to do, you know, we got some big research question we want to ask ourselves. The first thing is, does monetary policy affect real economic variables? Now, if we can establish that there is a relationship between the particular monetary policy shock you're looking at and some real economic variable or variables, if you can establish a relationship between them, <clears throat> the next question is, how does it work? So once we establish that monetary policy can have some kind of an impact on real economic variables, the next thing we want to know is how. And we want to know how for a number of reasons. One, we just want to learn more. Two, we want a good publication out of it. Three, we want to know how it works so we can target policy towards these channels in the future if we need to. Now, this goes without saying, but not every situation is the same. Not every time we end up in a recession is going to have, it's not going to be the same set of circumstances. The thing that caused the recession in 2008 is not what caused the recession in 2020, for example. Now, there are situations where, you know, various swings at monetary policy, you know, attempts at monetary policy might generally be the same, but the way that it operates will be different, the way it transmits through the economy. So for a more like concrete, explicit definition of what the transmission mechanism of monetary policy is, it's the process by which asset prices and general economic conditions are affected as a result of monetary policy decisions. Such decisions are intended to influence aggregate demand, interest rates, and the amount of money and credit to affect overall economic performance. So the idea is we want to know exactly how monetary policy transmits from a nominal side shock over to affecting real, or a nominal demand side shock to affecting real supply side variables. So we got like a beginning and an end here. The beginning is the Fed policy. The end is some change in real economic performance. And we want to know how we get from the beginning or like from point A, which is the beginning, to point B, which is the end. It's that middle part that we're interested in. So, you know, if you've seen the movie Seven and, you know, you, you know how it ends. Well, Gwyneth Paltrow's head ends up in the, the box at the end because um, uh, Kevin Spacey, cut it off and for his sin of, uh, what, what was it? Uh, jealousy, I think. Um, and then he wanted, uh, Brad Pitt to murder him out of wrath, which would be the seventh deadly sin or whatever. Um, that's cool, but you kind of want to see how you get to that point, you know, namely, I guess for this, cause you don't really see the thing with the, the head in the box coming at all. You do see how Brad Pitt's character develops over the like two and a half hours that the movie runs to bring him to the point where he would actually do something like that. It's that middle part that we're interested in here. It's the way that monetary policy transmits to real economic activity. And there are a number of ways in which Fed policy can affect real economic variables. It's not like there's just one particular transmission mechanism. There are many transmission mechanisms. And these many transmission mechanisms can operate simultaneously, which is a pretty cool thing. But... The idea is 
monetary policy is driving shocks to aggregate demand. And we're going to be learning how that operates a little bit later. But this is a nominal shock. It's a demand side shock. So like if aggregate supply is upward sloping and it's not vertical, then if you have a shock to aggregate demand, it can affect output and prices. On the other hand, if aggregate supply is just vertical, well, it'll only impact prices and have no effect on output. So the question really becomes, <clears throat> what variables are affected that lead to that shock in aggregate demand? How is aggregate demand moving? Because once aggregate demand moves, then we'll kind of have an idea because we're like, okay, well, now this transmits along you know, this upward sloping supply curve, and that's how we can get changes in real economic activity. But what is it specifically that's moving the demand curve? And the things in between the monetary policy change and the movement in aggregate demand are known as intermediate targets. And these intermediate targets by themselves don't have a lot of effect on aggregate demand, but they can affect broad financial conditions, which can then affect aggregate demand. So it's like a bunch of little helpers kind of pushing the aggregate demand curve around. So if we had a vertical aggregate supply curve, you would see graph one here, all right? This is an aggregate supply curve that is independent of prices. In other words, regardless of where the general equilibrium would be, whether it's here at AD0 and P0 or AD1 and P1, regardless, output is going to be the same. So with a vertical aggregate supply curve, output is fixed and it's determined only by supply side factors. Again, we'll be learning about that over the next couple of chapters in this book. If, on the other hand, you have an upward sloping aggregate supply curve, well, now the story becomes a little different because if we have a demand shock, if demand goes from AD0 up to AD1, well, our equilibrium price level and output change. So the equilibrium price level increases, doesn't increase anywhere near as much as it does over here, but it does increase a little bit. And because this aggregate supply curve is upward sloping and not vertical, not only does the price level not increase all that much, but you actually get some kind of an increase in output. So you get an increase in output and prices. Now, generally, you care a little bit more about trying to get the increase in output, but in order to get that increase in output, you're going to have to tolerate a little bit of an increase in prices as well. Now, it's not always going to be a bad thing that prices increase. And you're probably going like, dude, what? But remember what I was talking about with expected inflation, and you want to have your expected inflation to be anchored. Well, if inflation falls below inflationary expectations and we're in a recession, well, that can be a little bit of a problem. And you're going to want to engage in expansionary monetary policy, cause a demand shock to try to bring the price level back up to try to get inflation back up towards the ex like the anchored expectation so that the expectations of inflation don't become unanchored. That would be a bad thing. And we talked all about why that would be a bad thing in previous lectures. So we're interested in how aggregate demand is moving, how it's shifting, what's causing it to shift. And again, What's causing it to shift is that actual transmission mechanism of monetary policy. And the first one that we're going to learn about is the interest rate channel. And the idea here is that the Fed purchases treasury securities, which then has an impact on the federal funds rate. <clears throat> this is a short-term nominal interest rate. Now, from the Fisher equation, where the real interest rate is equal to the difference between the nominal interest rate and expected inflation... If expected inflation is set, then changes to the nominal interest rate can determine the real interest rate. And this would also affect the long-term interest rate, which affects interest-sensitive spending. And interest-sensitive spending would be, you know, if you want to buy like a house or a car or something like that. Ultimately, because of this, more people want more stuff and boom, you get an increase in aggregate demand. So the idea is if the Fed lowers interest rates, it gets cheaper to borrow money to buy stuff. And as such, you're going to want to borrow more. As you borrow more, well, the supply of money in the economy begins to increase. And with that increase in the supply of money, well, 
there's now more money floating around and people are going to want to spend that more money. More people want more stuff. Increase in aggregate demand. Now, we're going to be coming back to this one a little bit later because this interest rate channel is like, all right, well, it's a short-term interest rate. But if, say, the Federal Reserve were to change its policy rate to like a longer-term interest rate and that operates as well, well, hey, guess what? The interest rate channel still operates. It's just a different interest rate that's operating. Okay, so on to other things. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the exchange rate channel. Here, if the Fed purchases Treasury securities, it's going to lower interest rates. Now, borrowing increases, the money supply increases. That increase in the money supply devalues the home currency relative to foreign currencies, which then changes the exchange rate. The home currency becomes relatively cheaper than the foreign currency. So more foreigners are going to want more stuff made at home. Boom, increase in aggregate demand. Now, this is something that's known as uncovered interest rate parity. And the idea between uncovered interest rate parity is that a lower interest rate is going to imply a weaker currency. So this can operate in conjunction with other channels. For example, the interest rate channel can be activated, and this channel can be simultaneously activated. It doesn't just have to be one channel working at one point in time. You can have multiple channels. It's, it's working in different ways, in multiple ways. So the next channel we're going to want to talk about is the wealth channel. Now, under the wealth channel, what happens? The Fed purchases treasury securities, which lowers interest rates. This lower interest rate increases the price of equities, which increases financial wealth. And this has like a twofold effect. The first effect on households, well, it positively impacts consumption expenditures. Well, okay, boom, there's the shift to aggregate demand. Has an effect on firms as well. There's an increase in market valuation of the firm relative to the cost of capital, which leads to an increase in investment spending. So when households and firms increase their spending, they want more stuff, and boom, increase in aggregate demand. <clears throat> We're sort of going to talk about this channel a little bit, kind of, when we talk about unconventional monetary policy channels uh, later on in this lecture. The fourth channel that we're going to talk about is the balance sheet channel. Now, under the balance sheet channel, what happens is the Fed purchases Treasury securities, which lowers interest rates. This reduction in interest rates increases asset prices. And this increase in asset prices increases the collateral value of borrowers, and this increases loans. And when more loans are made, more people want more stuff, boom, increase in aggregate demand. I'm sure you're starting to notice a little bit of a trend now. You got all these different things that happen, and then the end result is, boom, increase in aggregate demand. And it's going to continue to be that way for the most part. All right. Fifth channel we're going to talk about is a bank lending channel. Under this channel, the Fed purchases treasury securities, which lowers interest rates. The reduction in interest rates increases reserve balances held by depository institutions at the Fed. This lower cost of reserves leads to an increase in bank loans, and this increase in loans leads to an increase in spending by bank-dependent firms and consumers. And when more loans are made, more people want more stuff, boom, increase in aggregate demand. Now, you're probably going like, hey, dude, this doesn't sound that different from the balance sheet channel. And the thing is, a lot of times, you can have some intermediate outcomes that might be a little similar, but the driving force behind them is different. So just like you can have different driving forces behind an increase in aggregate demand, you can have different driving forces behind some of these intermediate variables or these intermediate targets as well. Now, the balance sheet channel operates because of changes to the value of existing assets on the bank's balance sheet. And the bank lending channel operates because of the cost of borrowing, which creates new assets on the bank's balance sheet. So slightly different things happening here. Ultimately, you're getting an increase in loans, increase in the money supply, more people want more stuff, boom, increase in aggregate demand. But now we're going to move on a little bit further into different types of like bank lending behavior. The sixth channel we're going to talk about is the risk channel of monetary policy. When the Fed purchases treasury securities, it lowers interest rates. This reduction in interest rates reduces bank profitability. And the bank profit comes from the difference between the interest that they're earning on loans and the interest that they have to pay on deposits. And the interest that they earn on new loans falls. So if the bank's profitability drops and there's an injection of liquidity or you know an increase of um, money, or this monetary aggregate, we'd say like reserve balances, well, 
these banks are going to be more willing to take risk to try to increase their profits. So they're going to make riskier loans. This leads to a higher credit supply and a reduced risk premium. And when this happens, more people can borrow more and they want more stuff. Boom, an increase in aggregate demand. So what's happening here essentially is you can think of it as like yields are falling. And with this reduction in yields, there's going to be a search for yield. And this search for yield on the part of the banks is such that they're willing to make riskier loans. So they do that. And then that can lead to an increase in aggregate demand. So the thing is, though, monetary policy operates very differently depending whether or not short-term interest rates are at or near the zero lower bound. If interest rates are comfortably above the zero lower bound, then conventional monetary policy operates, and it also works. If interest rates are at or near the zero lower bound, then conventional monetary policy doesn't operate. And the thing is, some central banks have experimented with negative uh, nominal interest rates before. We have not. The Federal Reserve has not taken a stance towards adopting a negative interest rate policy. So for the Federal Reserve, if interest rates are stuck at the zero lower bound, you need to do something else. And this is where unconventional monetary policy comes in. What happens is for the Federal Reserve, um, there have been four rounds of what's known as quantitative easing. Three rounds were following the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, and then a fourth round followed in 2020 when COVID hit. The idea is when short-term interest rates are at zero, well, the central bank can do one of two things. They can either let them go below zero or they can target some other variable as um, like a substitution of sorts. So they shift their policy variable from a short-term interest rate to something like a long-term interest rate or say the level of the monetary base. And quantitative easing was essentially that they shifted their attention or their, their focus away from the federal funds rate over towards some longer-term rates and the level of the monetary base. And the idea was if you could have this massive injection of liquidity, one, you didn't have to go into negative interest rate territory, and two, you could lower long-term interest rates, which then flattens out the yield curve a little bit, and then that would have an effect on aggregate demand. So... There are multiple ways that unconventional monetary policy can work. The first way that we're going to talk about is the portfolio rebalancing channel. Now, this channel operates or activates when the Fed buys long-term treasury and mortgage-backed securities, which then drives down the yield on these securities, and investors are driven away from these treasury and mortgage-backed securities markets and into private equity markets or like stock markets. This leads to an increase in equity prices, and this increase in, increase in equity prices, sound it out, Jeremy, means the stock market does better. And as the stock market does better, while well, households are better off, and as households are better off, more people want more stuff, boom, increase in aggregate demand. Now, this has actually been argued um, fairly, fairly well, we'll say. Um, in the academic literature, Wyledek and Wheel in their 2016 paper find evidence of this channel operating in the U.S. after 2008. And even Ben Bernanke has argued that this channel operated during quantitative easing in the U.S. after 2008. And he was the chair of the Fed at the time. So there's, there's a good bit of, I guess you could say, like documented evidence that this channel operated. <clears throat> now the next one, there's a little bit of mixed evidence here about this channel operating, uh, but it's interesting nonetheless, and it's what's known as a signaling channel. Previously, really in all of the channels of monetary policy that we've talked about up until this point has been the Fed does something, right? The Fed increases their purchases of treasury securities or their tre purchases of treasury and mortgage-backed securities, which is what they did during quantitative easing. Here, they don't. Instead, this is more from what they're saying. So the previous transmission mechanisms had been like, this is based on what we're doing. And this one is more what we're saying. This operates through the formation of the expected future path of short-term interest rates. So instead of going like, okay, we're going to have asset purchases and that's going to lower interest rates. Here, 
the interest rates they're talking about are already at zero, so they can't go any lower. So what happens is the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC, announcements occur, and what happens is the chair of the FOMC, who is currently Jerome Powell, they'll meet and they'll decide on their monetary policy decisions, and then the chair will come out and announce the FOMC's decision on live TV. Now, during quantitative easing, the Fed chair would come out and announce plans for the future evolution of short-term interest rates. Now, they would say, we're going to continue to buy, you know, X amount of treasury and mortgage-backed securities each month, blah, blah, blah. And so this is kind of operating along with other channels of monetary policy. But what they would do here is they would use something that's known as forward guidance. And it would be like going, well, we expect to raise rates early next year, or we expect to keep rates low for the next year, something along those lines. And then markets would be responding to these announcements. So if people expect interest rates to be low for longer than what was previously anticipated, long-term interest rates would also be held down. And as such, the more people borrow more money, more people want more stuff, boom, increase in aggregate demand. So this is a pretty interesting channel, and there's like mixed evidence as to whether or not it operated. Wiledeck and Wheel in their 2016 paper, which will also be an assignment for you guys to read, uh, found some mixed evidence for the signaling channel operating, and they found a little bit more evidence in favor of the portfolio rebalancing channel. Now, let's come back to the risk channel. So the risk channel is also argued to have operated in the U.S. during quantitative easing. So here, the Fed bought different treasury securities, and they also bought mortgage-backed securities because they started buying long-term treasury securities, and they also bought mortgage-backed securities, which drove down the yield and lowered bank profitability. And I know that we've been through all this already, but the thing is, my dissertation's on this channel during quantitative easing. I find evidence that it operated during QE, and I think it's pretty cool. So we're going to talk about it at least for another minute or two. And the thing is, like, banks aren't the only entities that are going to be willing to take on more risk. So you have the search for yield by other investors. And if yields on low-risk assets are driven down, well, maybe you're willing to take on some more risk in other investments to get that yield back to where you want it. So let's say you get like a 5% return on low-risk assets. Well, the return on those low-risk assets drops to like 2%. And you're like, I'd rather be in the 4 to 5% area. That's my preferred habitat for this yield. Now, you also have a preferred risk habitat. You don't want to take too much risk because, well, that's kind of bad. It's risky. You might be a little willing to step outside of that preferred risk habitat to get this yield back that you want. You might go, hey, I'll take a little bit of risk. I'll take like one tiny little step out of my preferred risk habitat, take on a touch more risk than maybe what I'm comfortable with, if that means I can get my yields or my returns back up from, say, 2% to, like, 4 to 45 or hopefully even 5%. And as such, you fund riskier investments. And as your earnings increase, it says as yields increase, that, that was maybe a little bit of a misnomer. It's more like as your returns increase, more people want more stuff, boom, increase in aggregate demand. So thing is, you've probably noticed that all these channels go from changes in Fed policy to shifts in aggregate demand. And in terms of what the central bank can do, it kind of ends there. From here, it's all hinged on the short-run aggregate supply curve not being vertical. If it is vertical, any shift in aggregate demand doesn't have any effect on output. It only impacts the price. Now, the flatter the short-run aggregate supply curve is, right? It'll still be upward sloping, but it's like a shallower increase. In that case, well, output becomes more responsive to an aggregate demand shock. And if short-run aggregate supply is perfectly flat, then output completely responds and prices don't. Now, bear in mind, this is only for the short run, not if it's perfectly flat, but even if it's upward sloping. It's only short-run aggregate supply stuff. In the long-run, aggregate supply is vertical because it is independent of anything other than real supply-side factors. So, as such, if short-run aggregate supply gets steeper, it becomes more supply-determined. And if it gets flatter, well, it becomes more demand-determined. 
And to see what I'm talking about, well, let's just look back at that graph that I showed you guys earlier on in this lecture. We had a vertical aggregate supply and an upward sloping aggregate supply. Maybe a better way to describe this is a long run aggregate supply for the vertical case, and then the upward sloping is a short run aggregate supply. And so in the long run, if there's any change to demand, well, there's no change in output because in the long run, prices are perfectly flexible. And as such, the only thing that determines supply is the supply side of the economy. It's independent of any demand side fluctuations. But in the short run, if prices are sticky and they can't fully adjust in response to a demand shock, well, you have to get a little bit of a response and output in order to maintain an equilibrium. So in the short run, you can get a little bit of an increase in output. Prices will move a little bit. And then in the long run, prices increase some more as we converge towards this long run equilibrium rather than a short run equilibrium. Okay, so we've talked about different transmission mechanisms and we've talked about really where, where it ends, right? And it ends with the increase in aggregate demand. Everything else is left to the supply side. Because the Fed, remember, can't do anything to actually affect supply side variables. All they can do is just affect output based on essentially taking advantage of the inability of prices to adjust in response to a shock. So that is, it's like going, all right, well, the Federal Reserve, if they print a bunch of money, is that going to give a farmer additional like bushels of hay? No, it's not. Right. If like with Milton Friedman's uh, thought experiment with the, the helicopter drop of money, right, dropping that money doesn't mean you get like more stuff like it means that you may want to go out and buy more stuff. But that doesn't mean more stuff gets made. More money doesn't make more stuff. Right. Eventually, what happens is more money just bids the price up of the existing stuff that you have. So we've established that. What we haven't talked about is how we determine what transmission mechanism operated. And to answer this question, it really depends on what we're doing. For the context of this course, because what we're doing is kind of like short to medium run, kind of leading into long run behavior. We're not looking at like immediate responses to financial variables or something like that. That's, well, a different course entirely. Here, we're looking at like, you know, monthly and quarterly data. So for data of like that frequency, vector autoregression models are awesome. And what we're doing is we're going to use the impulse responses of a VAR model, and it's going to help tell us what the transmission mechanism is. Now, another tool that we'd want to use alongside this is to see how much variance of each variable is explained by the shocks of interest, namely how much variance in real variables are explained by these shocks. And... Certain shocks might explain more variance than the others, and that'll kind of tell us, oh, hey, this transmission mechanism probably operated over this one. But that's a little bit outside the scope of this course. Um, I really don't want to go that far into the, the details and the weeds of this. So we're just kind of, let's just assume that we're going to hold that part just kind of constant and just not worry about it. All we're going to look at are impulse responses here. And the idea would be, if the impulse response of the variable that we think might be relevant, moves in the direction that we want it to, and it does it has a significant response, meaning it moves and is statistically significant in how it moves. Well, that is evidence that the channel that we thought is operating actually worked. So we're going to do a couple examples. The first one that we're going to do is the portfolio rebalance channel. And in this channel, what happens is while well, the Fed purchases long-term treasury and mortgage-backed securities, so we see their asset holdings or reserve balances increase. Then the yield on the 10-year treasury will fall because as they buy long-term treasuries, the yield on the long-term treasuries will fall. S&P 500 index prices will increase. And that is, of course, consistent with investors going from these like long-term government debt markets into private equity markets. So you'll see that increase in equity prices. And then output and prices will increase consistent with an aggregate demand shock. So if you see these responses, that would be evidence that the portfolio rebalance channel operated. So for all of the examples that I'm going through here, we're using data from 2008 up to 2020. 
And the variables that I'm going to start out with are the log of real GDP, the log of core PCE prices, the log of the money base, the 10-year treasury yield, and the log of S&P 500 prices. Now, I'm taking logs of these variables, of course, you know, not the interest rate, but the other variables, uh, because it's got some very nice mathematical properties in terms of like the statistical um, inference. Don't really worry about why. It's just I do it. As far as you need to be concerned, I do it because I do it. Um, and I identify the shocks consistent with a monetary policy shock. Now, if you're in this course, you don't need to know how it's done. Um, if you are not in the course and you're just you're interested and you know a little bit more about VAR identification, um, I do a combination of sign and zero restrictions uh, to identify a monetary policy shock. Um, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at these responses and see if they match with what we think they should be doing. And if we have significant responses of real GDP, prices, 10-year treasury yields, and the S&P 500, then what likely happened is the portfolio rebalancing channel is operating. So here's what we got. Let's walk through this in terms of like the, the, the process by which this would be happening. So there's an increase in the money base, right? So starting at T equals zero, right? Right here, this is the initial point of the shock. There's a jump in the money base. So as the money base increases, the 10-year treasury yield falls. Now, if the money base increases and you see a reduction in the 10-year treasury, that's consistent with them buying long-term treasury securities. So the quantity of money increases, and you can think of like the price of money sort of, falls. All right, that makes sense. So with this reduction in the 10-year treasury yield, you get a flattening out of the yield curve. Now, when that happens, more people want to borrow, you get an increase in the money supply. There's this injection of liquidity into the markets. As such, you get an increase in real GDP and prices because, well, you know, that's kind of what happens. But simultaneously, right, the S&P 500 is increasing. And the S&P 500 prices are increasing because the 10-year treasury yield falls investors are shifting their holdings of these 10-year treasuries and other long-term treasuries. Think of this as kind of like a catch-all for long-term treasuries. They're decreasing their holdings of these because, well, the Fed's buying them all up, right? So you're holding all these treasury securities. The money base goes up. What happens is what used to be holdings of treasury securities now just becomes cash in your hand. And any treasuries, like new treasuries that you're going to get are going to have lower yields. And you're going to like, yeah, I don't really know if I want to do that. So instead of buying those treasuries, you go into private equity markets. Now, what would be the benefit of that, economically speaking? Well, the thing is, if you're holding government debt, right, you're not really funding any private growth, any private economic activity. You're just funding government programs, more or less. So if you're holding this government debt and you keep buying government debt, you're not funding any like growth in private markets. So if that private debt is essentially taken away from you and converted into cash and any new government debt you get has a lower interest rate on it, you're like, I don't really know if I'm that interested in it anymore. Maybe I want to go and play around in the stock market a little bit. So you do that. And then the earnings that you get from the stock market increase. And with those increases in earnings that we can see from a significant increase in S&P 500 prices, because, right, because it increases about 1%, and you can see the bottom um, confidence band here is above zero, so it's a pretty consistently significant response. You get an increase in real GDP and prices, which is, again, if real GDP, if output and prices both increase, that's consistent with an aggregate demand shock. So here we have this whole story of the portfolio rebalancing channel operating, and it results in an aggregate demand shock.
So we can see that, in all likelihood, the portfolio rebalancing channel operated during quantitative easing. And we'd want to, theoretically, we'd want to do this to test every single channel that we think is going to operate. But you also want to cite theoretical liter literature and really other empirical literature on what the other possible channels could be. There's no point in testing channels that just don't really make sense here. If this is post-financial crisis stuff, different channels would be operating relative to conventional monetary policy regimes. So the thing is, though, if you want to test other channels, well, we need to use other variables. So the best way to really do this is generally you're going to see like four key variables, and it's going to be real GDP, prices, the money base, or some other monetary aggregate, and an interest rate. And it's like a four variable specification. It's kind of like the baseline of this. And then you would want to augment your VAR with other variables that you think may respond significantly. And the significant responses of these other variables would tell us what channel is or maybe isn't operating. So let's try another one here. And I figure if we do enough of these examples, you'll kind of start to get the gist of what's going on. So another channel that we're going to try is the exchange rate channel. So I'm going to use the same VAR specification as before. So I'm going to have real GDP, prices, monetary aggregate, um, long-term treasury yields, and the S&P 500. Now I'm going to add in an exchange rate. Now I'm adding the real broad trade weighted exchange rate. And this is an exchange rate index of the US dollar against other major currencies. And by adding this guy in there, we can see if the exchange rate is going to be significantly responding to any kind of a monetary policy shock. And the idea here would be, if there's a monetary policy shock and the exchange rate significantly responds, then the monetary policy shock would be transmitting to other countries via the exchange rate channel. right? So monetary policy, you're like, hey, it's traveling abroad to other countries via exchange rate channels. And the currency, essentially the U.S. currency, our dollar, becomes weakened relative to other currencies. And that triggers a demand shock not just in the U.S., but also abroad, right? So, and when I say abroad, I'm not saying other countries have a demand shock in other countries. The demand in other countries, like other countries' demand for U.S. goods will increase. So you get an increase in output and prices in the U.S., and that's because in terms of the exchange rate, our goods are relatively cheaper than theirs. So they're going to want more American stuff. And as such, you get an increase in aggregate demand in America. America. So if this channel operates, then what happens is you'd see the exchange rate fall, which implies the U.S. dollar is becoming cheaper relative to other currencies. In other words, other currencies appreciated in value relative to the dollar. So the euro becomes more powerful relatively than the dollar or the yen or uh, the British pound, things like that. They, that becomes higher value, right? It appreciates in value relative to the value of the dollar. So this is the, the real broad trade weighted exchange rate index uh, from 2008 up to 2020. And really just so you can kind of get an idea as to, you know, what the, the time series variable itself looks like. And this is what we're going to see when we run a VAR augmented with the exchange rate. So what's happening here? Well, now I've got the S&P 500 going on, but let's not worry about that one so much right now. Let's just look at the exchange rate. Okay, so we get this increase in the money base, reduction in the 10-year treasury yield. All right, well, when that happens, okay, the increase in the money base... 10-year treasury yield drops. Now, if you remember the whole stuff with uncovered interest rate parity, right, it's that currency movements are going to be, or like interest rate differentials are going to be proportional-ish to like changes in currency valuations. So with this drop in the exchange rate, the dollar becomes more valuable, or sorry, less valuable than other currencies, which means U.S. goods are relatively cheaper and just kind of as like an arbitrage effect here, people are going to go, screw it, buy American-made stuff. So you get an aggregate demand increase in the U.S. And how do you know if you have an aggregate demand increase? Well, real GDP and prices go up. So if real GDP increases and prices increase, boom, 
aggregate demand shock because if it's a supply side shock, well, prices would be falling with an increase in real GDP or GDP would fall with an increase in prices because they're moving in opposite directions. So if you see an increase in the money base, a reduction in an interest rate, and the exchange rate also falls, and real GDP and prices increase, well, that's probably a pretty good sign that the exchange rate channel was operating. So it appears the exchange rate channel was operating here. Because as the exchange rate falls, other currencies appreciate in value, leading to a demand shock in the U.S. from foreign economies. Now, there can actually be a little bit of a problem here. Um, and so if country A has a monetary policy expansion, country B doesn't follow suit, well, country B gets that shift in demand away from country B's goods over to country A's goods. As such, country B could theoretically go into a recession. Thus, in all likelihood, what happens is country B plays like a game of follow the leader and uses monetary expansion of their own. And they devalue their own currency such that that doesn't happen. But again, it could you know maybe be a little while before this shift in demand is observed and then, well, the other central banks would be responding in kind. There's another interest rate channel that has been operating this entire time and I haven't mentioned yet, and it's the interest rate channel. Because if you look at both of these VAR models, the 10-year treasury is falling significantly in both of them. And that implies the interest rate channel is operating. So it's worked so far in both of the VAR models that we've looked at. And this, again, is further evidence that multiple channels can be operating at once. So the exchange rate channel is clearly operating here. Portfolio rebalancing channel is clearly operating. But if you look at the 10-year treasury yield in both of these, it's falling significantly. And how do we know it's falling significantly? Well, if it falls below zero and that upper confidence band is also below zero, well, that is evidence right there that it's a significant response. So the 10-year treasury yield fell here significantly, fell here significantly. Hmm. So it's operating in both sets of impulse responses. And again, so this is what, three channels that are operating that we've noticed? Let's look at one more. Let's look at the risk channel. Now, what we would do here is we would take our standard four variable specification, right? GDP, prices, money, and an interest rate. And we want to add some measures of, say, the risk-taking that banks would engage in and measures of bank profitability. So we're going to use these four variables, and I'm also going to add a fifth one in, and it's interest on excess reserves, and that's going to give me like a short-term interest rate. And I'm doing this plus two key variables of interest, bank lending standards, and bank lending margins. So the lending standards, it's derived from a uh, like a survey that goes out quarterly. And it's essentially reported as a percentage of banks that are reporting tightening in credit conditions. And that's going to be the measure of the amount of risk banks are willing to take. If lending standards drop, that's an indication that banks are taking on more risk. Now, bank lending margins, this is the measure of the bank's profits. Because remember, the bank's profits are the difference in the interest that they're earning on loans that they make and interest they have to pay out on deposits. If there's a compression in lending margins, that means bank profits are falling. If they fall in response to a monetary policy shock, well, there's going to be a large liquidity injection. And as such, banks are going to take a little bit more risk with that increase in liquidity that they just got. Thus, they're going to be lowering their lending standards. If they lower their lending standards, again, remember, this is all part of that search for yield stuff that we're seeing. And with that additional liquidity, they go, we can take riskier loans because, well, we got all this extra cash that we're sitting on. You're going to be a little bit more willing to take a riskier, to make a riskier move if you've got a little bit more cash on hand. So they take that extra cash and they engage in slightly riskier lending practices, thus reducing their lending standards, and they do so to try to increase their lending margins or make more profit. And so what we would expect to see 
is if the risk channel is operating, then lending standards fall in response to lending margins falling. So then I would expect to see the signed responses of all the other variables that would be consistent with monetary policy shocks that we've seen before. So I've got lending standards and lending margins here. Again, just so you can kind of see what they look like. And boom, here we go. Here are the results. So what are we looking at? Well, reserve balances increase. So this increase in reserve balances and a drop in the 10-year treasury yield as well as a drop in interest on excess reserves. But not really because it's not really a totally significant response here. So maybe just don't really worry about this guy so much. Just look at the 10-year treasury yield. So reserve balances increase, the 10-year treasury yield falls. Now at the same time, lending margins fall. And they fall by about 200 basis points or two percentage points. So lending margins fall by about two percentage points and in response, lending standards fall. Now you're probably going, well, it looks like they're increasing. They're not increasing because if you look at what the vertical axis here is, right? Negative 12, negative 10, negative 9, negative 8. Cool. So this is telling me that lending standards fall because they go, assume that they're kind of like following along like zero here. And then at T equals zero, that shock happens and they jump down. So they drop. So lending standards drop, and that is consistent with what we would expect to see, the reduction in lending standards to try to increase lending margins, again, to try to increase their profits. So we're seeing, with this injection of liquidity and this reduction in the 10-year treasury yield, right, monetary policy shock, banks lower their lending standards to try to increase their lending margins, and as such, well, more loans are made, more money's entering the markets, more people want to buy more stuff. Increase in aggregate demand, real GDP, and prices increase. So what we're seeing here is further evidence that the risk channel of monetary policy operated. So the risk channel operated during the same time as the interest rate channel, portfolio rebalance channel, and exchange rate channel. So multiple channels can operate simultaneously. Now... Again, some might be working more than others. Wiledeck and Wheels' 2016 paper found evidence that the portfolio rebalance channel likely operated more than the signaling channel did. Now, there's a big drawback to a lot of this, and the drawback is that there's no counterfactual to see what would have happened in the absence of monetary policy shocks because, well, that didn't happen, right? We just had monetary policy shocks in response to these recessions that we enter. There's no way to go, well, we saw what the Fed didn't do, and we compared that to what the Fed did, because the only outcome here is just what the Fed did. And we could try to construct counterfactuals. It can be done to relative varying degrees of success. Um, there's another counterfactual that we didn't consider, and it's what would have happened if the Fed used a negative interest rate policy. Because all this is based on the Fed using uh, just a zero interest rate policy and then moving their attention from short-term uh, interest rates over to longer-term interest rates. Well, here it might be a little easier. You could construct a counterfactual short-term interest rate that could go below zero, and you do so using the Taylor rule, which we'll you know, play with a little bit more uh, further on down the line in the class. You could also use something like the term structure of interest rates to try to sort of back out what a negative short-term interest rate would be. And then you could use that counterfactual short-term interest rate to go below zero and go, all right, well, if the Fed did have a negative interest rate policy, this is what would have happened. And the nice thing about that is you could then compare regimes of like conventional monetary policy regimes to unconventional monetary policy regimes. And you could do so using the same sets of variables, which admittedly is a, a very nice um, thing to be able to do. But that's enough of the transmission mechanism for today. I know it's I'm going on, what, about 50 minutes here. Uh, so this wraps everything up for the transmission mechanisms, which is an incredibly important topic in monetary economics because we need to know how different channels are operating, again, so we can tweak policy in the future to try to be a little bit more effective.
because there's no point in trying to target like a short-term interest rate channel if there's no evidence it works. But again, remember, each situation is going to be different. Not all recessions would have the same causes. And these questions extend just, they do extend beyond academia because FOMC Chair Jerome Powell, when he comes out, he'll specifically mention various channels of monetary policy during the FOMC announcements. Um, however, this is the last lecture before exam one. So everything we've done up to this point is fair game for the exam. Um, there will be one paper I want you guys to read for the uh, exam. It's Wiledeck and Wheels 2016 paper that I've been referencing borderline ad nauseum in this lecture. Um, now, I'm also going to post a study guide to help give you guys an idea as to what you might be up against um, while trying to figure out, you know, what could or could not be on the exam. However, the exam will cover everything up to this chapter. So you'll be responsible for everything from chapter one up to chapter 11. Um, and with all of that said, thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it, you know, even half as enlightening as I did. Um, I absolutely love the transmission mechanism of monetary policy stuff, uh, because, well, that's kind of where a lot of my dissertation was spent. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys found it as interesting as I do and, um, be on the lookout for more videos and more stuff to come in the future. Thanks for watching. Bye.